and welcome. I am Sana Khan and you are watching World is One Global Leadership Series, a show where leaders from around the world share their ideas, visions and perspectives. On the show this week, we have Mohammed Nasheed, the first democratically elected president of the Maldives, a country caught in deep political turmoil under the Abdullah Yameen government. The president spoke to me during his first visit to India since leaving the Maldives in January 2016. He is the first Maldivian politician to topple a dictator who rules for 30 years and become the island state's first democratically elected president in 2008. Mohammed Nasheed resigned four years later under disputed circumstances. The former journalist and human rights activist of the Maldivian Democratic Party was jailed but eventually took asylum in the United Kingdom where he received the support of none less than celebrity lawyer Amal Clooney to defend him against a controversial conviction. Now, Maldives is once again witnessing political turbulence. Regular bouts of political turmoil threaten a vital tourism industry on the Indian Ocean archipelago of just 400,000 people. July 3, 2017 will go down in Maldivian history as a day of considerable importance. After several failed attempts to mount a challenge of note to President Abdullah Yameen's absolute control over the island nation, a united opposition led by the grand old man of Maldives, Maumoon Abdul Gayoum and the charismatic Mohammed Nasheed cobbled together the support of 45 lawmakers. Their primary aim? To unseat the speaker, a staunch Yameen loyalist. A similar opposition bid to oust the same speaker was defeated in March when several lawmakers were evicted or walked out to protest against what they said were discrepancies in the vote count. But Mohammed Nasheed is determined to return to the Maldives and reinstate democracy in the inherently tolerant and idyllic country. So what brings you to India and uh, how do you like the place? Well, thank you very much for um, having me. Um, I love India. I've always liked coming here. Um, I've been traveling all throughout India since my student days. And this is the first time I've been able to come um, after my release from prison. Uh, you would know that soon after the coup, um, I was imprisoned, and, um, but I was able to travel on medication. And then after that, I sought asylum. Um, and I'm, this is the first time I'm, I've been able to come to India after that. I'm here because um, your think tanks are having um, a conference, uh, uh, a conference on developing countries, especially uh, dialogue between developing countries. It's research and information systems for developing countries, and we are going to be talking about the challenges. Right. Well, welcome to India. But you know, your visit it seems significant because of the timing. What's happening in the parliament in Maldives, the Majlis? It, it's in chaos. You know, we we we've seen those scenes. It's under siege. Police and army are out on the roads. Uh, can you explain to us what's going on there? Well, President Yamin came into government um, in a coalition, a broad coalition. We were the opposition. Everyone else was, was together with President Yamin, especially his own brother and also the other two smaller Mr. parties, Gayum, Mr. Gayum, right? yeah. and also the other two smaller parties. But uh, he, he soon after coming into government, um, his alliance fell apart. Uh, a rift developed between his brother and himself. And finally, President Gayoum crossed over and started working with the opposition, with us. And therefore, we've been able to come out with a, a stronger alliance, stronger opposition. And uh, we won the majority of the parliamentarians, the confidence of the majority of the parliamentarians. With Gayoum, more than 17 MPs crossed over. And therefore, President Yamin lost uh, the majority that he had in the parliament. And since then, he's got the military inside the majlis, inside the parliament. And he has stopped smooth functioning of parliament almost completely. And uh, he has also got the elections commission to illegally say that some of the MPs have lost their seats. Right. Now, these MPs therefore went to the Supreme Court. 
And the majority of the judges felt that they have not lost their seats. And the majority of the judges did not want to rule in favor with the government. Right. So he has therefore obstructed the Supreme Court as well. So it's been over, over one and a half months now uh, since the MPs were not able to come into the parliament. Right. And the Supreme Court has not come out with a judgment. Um, and this, the deliberations are over. Hmm. Uh, we are told by um, other judges that the judgment is in our favor. Right. But the president um, is intimidating uh, the Supreme Court chief judge and the chief judge is unable to come out or rather unable to come out with this judgment. And so therefore we have a situation where hmm. the parliament is str stuck, right. the Supreme Court is stuck. So the judiciary is unable to function, Absolutely. the legislature is unable to function, and the state is not functioning. So it's not just the political turmoil, it, it, it's, it's much deeper, it's sort of a ripple effect as you're putting it. But, uh, but President Nasheed, the immediate issue seems to be that of the impeachment of the Speaker. Now you, along with the other opposition parties, want him to go. Explain to us why, what's happening, why, why is it that you want the Speaker well, to leave? Well, the Speaker has, during the course of the last two or three years, uh, turn around a number of uh, um, legislations and the, this, these uh, uh, turning of legislations were not done according to parliamentary proper procedure. They have also tempered with parliament rules and they have tried their best to make the parliament a rubber stamp institution which was what we had in the past and therefore we didn't, we do not want to go there. Hmm. Um, we've been asking, we've been trying to reach out to the speaker, asking the speaker uh, to, to, to get the parliament to function independently of the executive. Now that's what our constitution has asked to do. Uh, we got separation of powers f through this constitution, but now we've lost those separations and the president is able to control the parliament. So we want to bring in a more independent um, speaker who would be able to run this parliament according to the constitution and according to the wishes of our people. So essentially the speaker uh is working at the behest of the current president of Maldives. But uh, uh, let's say if he were to go up, who would be a proper replacement for the current speaker, considering that uh, everybody under the present, uh, you know, President Yameen uh, seems to be uh, following his orders, his commands? Well, the uh, joint opposition, we have the majority in the parliament. We have agreed upon um, the MDP parliamentary leader, um, Ibrahim Muhammad Saleh to be the new speaker. And we have also agreed that uh, Farish Gayoum, President Gayoum's son, mm. would be the new deputy speaker. So we have, a very, we have a legislative agenda that we want to proceed with after the changes to the speaker and the deputy speaker. So uh, we have a very clear understanding among ourselves on who would lead after the speaker goes. And uh, believe me, the speaker will go. All right. All right. Uh, you know, overall, how do you see uh, the Abdullah Yameen government as an important member of the opposition, being a former president? How, what do you think is happening right now under him? Well, you know, one of the things that he has done was, is, A, we have gone into debt to a single country, our international debt, more than 70% of our international debt is now to a single country, China. Yeah. And this has taken us to a debt trap. And soon we would be in a situation where more than 40% of our budget would be on servicing these debts. We would be spending more than we spend for education and health combined just to pay the interest of these debts. And we build these huge infrastructure projects with, right. with loans from exim banks, from supplier credits. We build bridges to nowhere, we build roads that leads to nowhere, um, airports that keep empty. And, and in, in very many similar fashions as a number of other countries have, have gone through with um, Exim Bank Finance, Chinese right. Exim Bank right. Finance and Supplier hmm. Credit. So uh, uh, one of the things that uh, President Yamin very hmm. worryingly has done is taken the country into a debt trap. Right, that's uh, we, one. That's one. Yeah. The other is he started working with extremist Muslim, ex extremist Islam. Uh, Saudi Arabia, for the last so many years, have propagated a very narrow version of Islam in the Maldives. Uh, and that has created a breeding ground for 
further radical Islam. Hmm. Now, uh, uh, President Yamin has aligned himself with the Salafists, which is a marginal group in the Maldives, and wants to bring in these uh, um, radical extremist Islamic ideas. Um, that is again uh, um, rocking or rather uh, uh, giving a number of shocks to our way of life. Right. Uh, and also in, 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 we have the highest amount of people per capita fighting for the ISIS. Now these kind of groups creates a breeding ground for recruitment. Right. Uh, and therefore uh, we, ha we are in this very unfortunate situation where a number of our young people are fighting in Syria and Levant. And we are also very worried that sooner or later they're going to come back. Right. Especially when the war ends in Syria. Especially when the war ends in Iraq. And the present government is not seeing... The present government seems to be working ahead. with them. The right. present government, present government, is in alliance with them, right. and they, the President Yamin has a view that as long as he can remain the president, it doesn't matter what happens to the rest of the country and rest right. of the people. We have a way of life that we've lived in South Asia for centuries, and we don't want to change that. President Nasheed, what are your expectations from India now that you're here? Are you are you? Are there any gov meetings lined up with government officials from India or not yet? Are you looking at something? Are you expecting something out of this visit? Well, um, um, I'm here uh, on the invitation uh, of um, RIS, RIS yeah. which is run by uh, 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 sponsorship of the foreign affairs. And therefore, I would be meeting a number of government officials and so on. And we will be having these conversa conversations and I will be meeting a number of people. And I'm sure um, that the Indian gov government is very, very aware of what's happening in the Maldives. They keep a very close tag. They observe it very well. Um, and um, I'm sure um, India would be mindful about Indian Ocean stability and democracy in the Maldives. Uh, but what are your expectations again? Because India traditionally has maintained, and this is the same with all of its neighbors, it talks of friendly ties. Anything in particular that you're looking from uh, the Narendra Modi government at this point, looking at the situation back home? Well, you know, we would like to have free and fair elections. And we would like political parties to be able to field the candidates of their choice. Uh, and we would like the Elections Commission um, to be impartial. And uh, we would hope that the international community, and more specifically India, would engage itself in the Maldives and see that these matters run accordingly. And I have a lot of trust in India, and I believe that this will happen. Right. Uh, why do you say more specifically India? So I come back to my question saying that uh, do you see this present government different from the previous government? Uh, well, and does that raise expectations? Well, it, I mean, not necessarily who is politically in government. Right. There are Indian institutions. Um, Indian institutions have run, has maintained Indian democracy and your way of life um, for, a, for a very, very, very long time. And um, just today I heard your Supreme Court coming out with a beautiful judgment. Um, so it's not necessarily who is in government that we are looking at. Um, the people of India would decide on who would govern them. Right. But your institutions are very strong. So whoever who is in government, I believe, would be very closely and focused in, on, on the motives. And uh, specifically, the BJP, hmm. uh, Prime Minister Modi's government, uh, has been very receptive to issues in the Maldives. Prime Minister Modi has not visited the Maldives because first uh, of the situation in the Maldives and right. uh, the Prime Minister has wanted the situation in the Maldives to be more normal before the Prime Minister visit the country. We would like the Prime Minister to visit but we would also want the country to be more normal, peaceful. Right. Right. And I think, uh, uh, you know, we, especially because we are a centre-right government as well, a centre-right political party as well, and because we are in the International Democratic Union, and BJP is going to be uh, uh, hosting this year's International Democratic Union, and we would be able to therefore work with the BJP as well. Right. So there is a political alliance. Um, um, a political brotherhood or sisterhood, mm -hmm. uh, an understanding with the present government. But beyond that, there is India. 
Right. Uh, President Nasheed, other members of uh, the Maldives United Opposition have been in Delhi to lobby for support, you know, in the recent past. You've only come now. How do you see their effort? Did it uh, not bear any fruit? Uh, no, I think it's the build-up of their efforts. Um, uh, uh, India doesn't react to things. It builds up things. It, it, it has a gradual building up process of events. So we've been working with your uh, government institutions and government agencies. And I think uh, our other alliance partners have done exactly the same work. Um, it's very fortunate that I've been invited to come and I will try and speak to the people. I would try and see that we can impress upon your leaders the gravity of the issue in the Maldives. Is there a statement uh, you know, that you wish to make loud and clear to the Indian government? If there is one, then what is it? Most importantly, radical Islam in the Maldives is not in the interest of the stability of Indian Ocean. Yeah. It's not in the interest of the people of the Maldives. It's not in the interest of India. I believe it's not in the interest of people, India. And also for the Indian Ocean Islands or India's neighbours to be in a debt trap doesn't necessarily help us, neither it does help again the stability of the Indian Ocean. So these two issues are, 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 are I believe um, they are reading it, they are listening to it and they are uh, hopefully going to act upon it. So radical Islam and the debt trap. Okay. Uh, are you reaching out to any other uh, countries or members of the Well, I, I, I've just come from Sri Lanka. Right. Um, I've, I've met both the Prime Minister and the President. I've also met their government officials. Um, we are in conversation with Sri Lankan officials. We are also in conversation with British government officials um, and the United States as well. Uh, How yes. does Sri Lanka view the situation in Maldives, given the fact that both the Maldives and Sri Lanka share this common uh, you know, thing of a debt trap when it comes to investments from China? Well, um, um, Sri Lanka, of course, we would be learning. We are always learning from Sri Lanka. And Sri Lanka has always, irrespective of who is in government, irrespective of who is in opposition in the Maldives, they have always loved peace, Maldivians a peace, a, a safe haven. And they will, I hope, continue to do that. And I believe that they, they've never not done that in any time. So they will continue to do that. But also, as you mentioned, hmm. it's very, very important for us to have these conversations with Sri Lankan, Sri Lankan officials, especially for Sri Lanka to point out to the Maldives that the difficulty that they are in now Right. Uh, um, uh, and for us to learn from mm. it. And also, more than 20% of our tourism trade, which is our biggest trade, right. is actually owned by Sri Lankans. Um, they have ownership of resorts and they have ownership of the other uh, trade surrounding it. And also, we export the bulk of our fish to Sri Lanka. Right. And Colombo is our biggest town outside Mali. Mm. There are 50,000 Maldivians living in Colombo. Uh, that's our biggest town outside our capital island. Right. So um, Sri Lanka is a very important country for us. Absolutely. So uh, to look at ramifications, you don't need to look any further than uh, Sri Lanka. But, uh, you know, let's go back a little and talk about your relationship with President Kayum at this point. You know, to anyone who's been following what's happening in Maldives for a long time, the scenes playing out today in Malay seem very familiar. I mean, your history with President Kayum, for instance, now that you've joined hands with the current president's half-brother, how does it work? Well, you know, both President Gayum and myself and all the others, we've learned a lot in the last 10, 15 years. We've probably gained more experience than other countries would gain in 50, 60 years. How uh, so? Uh, because events have moved so fast. Uh, uh, the, the manner in which we brought in our new constitution, the manner in which we allowed for political parties, the manner in which we had our first multi-party elections, uh, the grace in which the president, in which President Gayum left, um, and the, the manner in which we were able to come into government, um, and also what ha what happened after we came into government, mm -hmm. how that government fell, and again the difficulties that President Gayum and the others had in uh, uh, forming an alliance with President Yamin, and the experience that the the bitter experience that they Followed. faced. Uh, with President Yamin in government. I think all that combined together 
has made us stronger, has made us, I believe, better people. Uh, and through that experience, we would hopefully be a better country. Right. Uh, President Gayoum, now, at this point, it seems he's preferring to lie low, you know, not much of uh, talks with the media as well. Why, why is that? And what, what is the aim behind this alliance? Is it, uh, as you put it, uh, look forward to a better Maldives, but will that only happen when this uh, present a president is ousted. Is that the ultimate goal? The ultimate, the, what we are looking for is a stable democratic government where the people of the Maldives can have their aspirations and can meet their aspirations. We believe we are a rich country. We have natural resources. We have good tourism. We have an excellent tourism trade. We have good fishing. And we can be affluent. We are a middle income country anyway. So we need not be so suppressed. And we, we want to bring the country back onto a more democratic track. We want to have good governance. We want to give what is due to the people. And uh, uh, for us to do that, uh, we must build a, as big a, an alliance as possible, a, become as amicable as possible. And working with President Gayoum, I've learned a lot. And I believe President Gayoum would have also learned something um, new from us, but he is being a very experienced politician in South Asia, one of the most experienced politicians in South Asia. It is interesting um, uh, to, to work with him, uh, and I will continue to work with President Gayoum. Um, we must try and see that Farish Gayoum, his son, is out of prison as quickly as possible. It's, it's an arbitrary detention, it's torture, it's, it's not proper. And, President, for President Yamin to keep his own nephew in jail just to remain in power is outrageous. Uh, and I don't think that people of the Maldives are going to tolerate that. All right. Uh, a couple of more questions. You know, despite international pressure that Maldives has seen, it still now seems it's going ahead with, uh, you know, reintroducing the death penalty uh, after a 60-year moratorium. How do you see that? Well, you know, to start with, even 60 years ago, it was an aberration. It was if you know, the president at that time just decided to kill someone or uh, uh, implement the death penalty. That wasn't the norm in the Maldives. Um, in the 1300s, when Ibn Batuta uh, was for a short time um, our chief judge, he extensively wrote about how the people of the Maldives saw uh, uh, corporal, corporal, corporal and capital punishment. And we've never wanted corporal and capital punishment. We've never had it. And uh, I don't think that the vast majority of the people of the Maldives would want to see that. But it still might be a reality. It soon. might be a reality. It's looking like a reality because there is, you know, we've had 16 murders, unaccounted murders. The police have not found what happened to them, what happened to these murders. So there is a boy in jail in death row, and there is a very strong view that the president wants to kill him to cover up some wrongdoing. Right. And so uh, because, because it's coming in such a difficult and uncertain time and clouded by all these other events, this is far more grave. And, and we hope that the international community will put their foot down and, and see that President Yamin doesn't go through um, capital punishment, doesn't go through murder. Right. Uh, my last question to you. Since you're here, we welcome you in India, but uh, your uh, last uh, thoughts as we conclude this interview on uh, your visit, your expectations, a message that you would send out to uh, you know, many viewers who might be watching you across the globe. Well, uh, I, I believe the Maldives and the Indian Ocean is important for world peace. We are a huge country. We are not small. We are a big ocean state. We are not, we are not a small island state. We are 1,000 kilometers from north to south and 200 kilometers each way. So we are actually bigger than Saudi Arabia in, in the territory that we occupy. And we occupy the navigable parts of the Indian Ocean. You cannot cross the Indian Ocean without crossing the Maldives. Anyone in history who has wanted to stabilize India has had to have a stable Maldives. 
and a democratic and a stable Maldives is in the interest of the Indian Ocean as it is in the interest of ourselves, our country, our people, our children. It is also in your interest. Thank you so much, President Nasheed, for talking to us. Pleasure having you on the show. Thank you very much.